We've been going through John chapters 19 and 20. 19 is about the crucifixion of Jesus. Chapter 20 is about the resurrection. So we're going to begin by reading chapter 20, John's Gospel. We're going to start at verse 1, and we're going to read all the way down to verse 29. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the tomb had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Again, in verse 29, uh, Jesus says to Thomas, 
Have you seen or have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, people are often like Thomas, whether it's the resurrection itself or some other incredible, unbelievable event. Unless I see it with my own eyes, I will never believe it. Maybe you've said that before. I won't believe it until I see it. And that's what Thomas said to the others about the resurrection. And I to see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Uh, but in John chapter 20, in those verses I just read, there is this one person who believes in the resurrection before he sees the risen Jesus. There's one person who believes without seeing Jesus. Who is this person? Well, it isn't Thomas, of course. We just read what he said. Unless I see it, I'm not going to believe it. It isn't Mary Magdalene. Until Jesus appeared to her, she assumed that somebody had taken the body of Jesus. That was the reason, in her mind, why the tomb was empty. Someone had taken the body. So it isn't Mary Magdalene. It's not Thomas. It's not Mary. Who is it? It is John himself, the author of this gospel. Uh, He refers to himself as the other disciple. He doesn't mention himself by name, but he is the other disciple. And it's John himself who doesn't see Jesus, but believes. Look at verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. So he saw something, but he didn't see Jesus because the tomb was empty. He saw something in the tomb that caused him to believe in the resurrection. Now you can believe in the resurrection without actually seeing the risen Jesus. But most people don't believe without seeing something. So John didn't see the risen Jesus at this point. But he saw something that caused him to believe. And so usually we need to see something. I don't believe God wants us to have a blind faith. A faith that just says, well, I just believe it. Because I believe it, then it must be true. People question that, well, why do you believe it? And if we don't really have a reason why, then we get angry when people start to question our faith. And so usually we see something. Probably not the risen Jesus, but something that leads us or encourages us to believe. So John was like that. John... At this point, the tomb was empty. That's all he knew. They had thought someone perhaps had taken the body. But when he went into that tomb, he saw something that led him to believe. What did he see? Well, look at verses 6 and 7. We're told that Simon Peter went in first. And John tells us what Peter saw. He saw the linen cloths lying there. Verse 6. Verse 7. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So John, after Peter went in, John went in after him, and he saw the same thing that Peter saw. We're not told what Peter thought, perhaps because this is John writing, and John knew what he believed in this moment. He believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw, verse 8, and believed. He realized that if someone had taken the body secretly, maybe stolen the body for whatever reason, they would not have left these cloths, these grave clothes behind. They wouldn't have left them neatly behind. What would 
the purpose of that be? If you're taking a body in the middle of the night, you're not going to be carefully leaving, un- unwrapping the cloths from the dead body and, and leaving it there nice and neat where the body had been and then going out. Uh, you're going to do that as quickly as possible and take the grave clothes with you. So, so John realized at this point that based on what he saw in that tomb, that Jesus had risen from the dead. He didn't see Jesus, but he saw enough. He saw something that led him to believe. So today, we probably won't see the risen Jesus. But you don't need to see the risen Jesus in order to believe. But you probably need to see something. Most people don't want to simply have a blind faith and just accept without any evidence something so amazing as a resurrection from the dead. Because this resurrection is really the foundation of our faith, the death and resurrection of Christ. Without that, then really we have nothing, as was read in 1 Corinthians 15 early. All of this is in vain. It's all just a waste of, of energy and time if Christ has not risen from the grave. I'm going to change these batteries while I go on. I brought some spare ones. Should have changed them before. But John saw something. Probably we want to see something as well. When we're thinking about something so amazing as the resurrection. It doesn't work now. It's probably broken. Sounds like it's working. Most people need to see some evidence of the resurrection before they believe. So my purpose here this morning is not to try to prove to you the resurrection. Uh, That would take a lot of time giving all of the various points of evidence that we could. But I think it's important whether we already believe it or not to remind ourselves at least or maybe learn for the first time that this is not just a blind faith. This is not just something we say, and it's not just something the Bible says, though I'm not lowering our view of the Bible. I believe it to be the inspired Word of God. But even beyond the Bible, there is evidence of the resurrection. Despite what some people claim, uh, the majority of scholars, whether they're Christian or not, they accept the following statements as facts. First of all, Uh, Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. Now, I know that there are some people who say that that Jesus never existed. He's a myth. But there are also people who believe that the moon landing was fake. There will always be people who will believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. It's also accepted as fact that Jesus was crucified. Uh, The Roman historians, a source outside the Bible, uh, Tacitus wrote that Christ suffered the extreme penalty, he was speaking of crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. So Jesus was a real person, he was actually crucified, and it's agreed that the tomb was empty. Christianity could never have started if the body of Jesus had been in that tomb. You could just go to the tomb, you could show people the body and say, no, he's not risen, he's still here, here's his body. And even in the Gospels, we see that the enemies of Jesus, they didn't, they didn't dispute that the tomb was empty. Uh, Matthew 28.3 says that Jesus' disciples, uh, this was the lie invented, that Jesus' disciples, this is what they said, that they came by night, they stole away uh, the body while the guards were asleep. That's what the enemies of Jesus were saying. That's what Matthew tells us. That was the story. And even later in the second century, uh, Justin Martyr uh, writes that that story was still circulated to that day. So it was never disputed that the tomb was empty, but people disputed, well, why was the tomb empty? 
So Jesus was a real person. He was crucified. Uh, most people accept that who studied it. But of course, people come to different conclusions as to who he is and why he was crucified and what the significance of that is and why the tomb was empty. It doesn't really make sense, though, that his followers stole the body because what is also accepted as fact is that the followers of Jesus really believed that they had seen the risen Jesus. Uh, their lives bear witness to that. That they were people who really believed in the resurrection. That it wasn't just a hoax that they had created by stealing the body. That they truly believed that they had seen the risen Jesus. They didn't act like people who had stolen the body. Uh, they were willing to endure so much, so much persecution. Some were even willing to die to carry on, to spread the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. They were people who were able to know whether or not what they were saying was true. And the fact that they were willing to die for this message, this gospel of Jesus Christ, is evidence that they did really believe this, that Jesus had risen from the dead. You might wonder, well, why did they believe it? Well, I would say because they really did see the risen Jesus. They didn't all hallucinate or some other explanation. Uh, that just doesn't happen uh, one time after another to a whole group of people. And then we also see that a notorious enemy of Christianity was converted. Paul, the apostle, he was once a persecutor of the church. We read that in the book of Acts, and he mentions it uh, a couple of times in his letters. He wanted to destroy Christianity. He wanted to do away with this message of Christ's death and resurrection and salvation through these events. And so he went around arresting Christians. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. He approved of that. But there, there was something that happened that changed the course of Paul's life. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, Paul claims that the risen Jesus had appeared to him. Now maybe some, as I said before, could argue that these, these other disciples, maybe they thought they saw Jesus because this is something that they wanted to happen. Though actually, they weren't expecting it, as the Gospels tell us. But maybe they really wanted it to happen, and so they thought they saw the risen Jesus. Well, Paul didn't want to see Jesus. And so a skeptic turned to faith in Christ, claiming to have seen the risen Jesus. These are all facts, as I said, that all scholars who studied first century history, studied the New Testament, whether believer or not. These are, these are facts that the majority of scholars accept. Now some, as I said, would have different explanations for these things, but what's the most reasonable explanation? Even if we forget what the Bible says, which we shouldn't, but I believe the most reasonable explanation is that Jesus did really rise from the dead. And so we can't see Jesus today. He's in heaven. But we can see something. We can see some things. We can see some evidence that he was a real person. He did, in fact, die on a cross. The tomb was empty. His followers did believe they had seen the risen Jesus. And even one of the greatest enemies of the Christian faith turned to faith in Jesus because... He claimed he saw the risen Jesus. If you read the Gospels, they really do have the ring of truth. They're believable. Uh, when you write a story, usually you want to leave out the details that make you look bad. But the Gospels don't do that. And also include details that perhaps really wouldn't help their story back in that day. 
A couple of details just to point out uh, in the, the gospel accounts that give us evidence that this, this story of the resurrection isn't a made-up story. Uh, first of all, the first witnesses of the resurrection were women. In that culture, any testimony of a woman would have been received with suspicion. Uh, perhaps that's why Peter and John they immediately run to the tomb. Uh, I guess in the, one of the other Gospels, I think it's Luke, uh, they say that uh, the other disciples, the men, they thought the women were uh, speaking nonsense when they talked about uh, the tomb being empty and angels appearing to them and telling them that Jesus had risen. They weren't believed. And so one of the reasons why this story is credible is because if they just invented this, they wouldn't have had the women going to the tomb early in the morning. The women being the first witnesses of the resurrection. If you're going to make it up, you would have made it up differently. And also, the first skeptics of the resurrection were the disciples. They didn't make themselves uh, look good. They weren't expecting a resurrection. Uh, they thought it was crazy, as most people would, uh, when they heard about the resurrection. Even though Jesus had talked about uh, dying and rising three days later uh, during his life, they still did not believe it. They did not believe it even when they were told the, uh, the news from the women. If you're going to make up a story, why make yourself look so bad? Uh, and so again, it has the ring of truth. There is more that could be shared, but my point is just to share with you uh, that if someone questions your faith, or maybe if you don't believe this, or maybe if you're starting to have doubts about it all, that this isn't merely a blind faith. There are facts, accepted facts. What's the best explanation of the facts? These Gospels, they don't appear to be made-up stories. They're not the kind of stories uh, that someone would make up. Some people will say, well, like Thomas did, unless I, unless I see the risen Jesus, unless I have some appearance uh, of him or if Unless God comes down to me and says it to me, then I won't believe it. But if that's true, if that's our approach, then how can we believe any historical event prior to the invention of the camera? We can't see it. You know, we can look at pictures of the last hundred years or so and say, yes, that must have happened. There's a picture or there's a video of that or maybe an audio recording. But how do we really accept historical events before that. Oh, we'll accept it because people saw them and they recorded them uh, in books. Uh, they passed them on down through the years. Uh, if we have such a high standard of believing the resurrection where I won't believe it unless I have that irrefutable piece of evidence, then how can we really believe anything that happened centuries ago? We accept many things that happened in history, but we have this different standard when it comes to, many do, when it comes to the resurrection. But we can be like John, who had not seen the risen Jesus, and yet he still believed because he saw something. There was some evidence there of the resurrection. Of course, he knew who Jesus was, he knew what he had taught, and probably that came back to him piece by piece, and he believed that Jesus was alive. You can think also of Mary, Mary Magdalene. And twice Mary is asked, Why are you weeping? She was weeping, why? Because the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. If you went to a cemetery where your loved one was buried and the body was gone, you would be upset. So Mary is upset. She's weeping because the body of Jesus is gone. Which is kind of ironic. She's weeping because the tomb is empty. 
But of course, she doesn't know what has happened. The body of Jesus wasn't gone because someone had taken it. The body was gone because he had risen. But in this life, like Mary, we do weep. Uh, There's pain, there's sorrow, there's death. There's also hope. There's hope because of the empty tomb. You know, we can feel empty in this life without hope. We don't have anything beyond this life that even the most successful person can feel this emptiness inside. There is reason to weep. But there's also reason for hope. There is hope to be found in Jesus Christ. Last question for you is, do you have this hope? this hope of something beyond this life, that there is more than just this. If you don't, then I would urge you to receive this hope through faith in Jesus Christ, to acknowledge your need of Christ because of your sin. He died for our sin. We have broken his law. We are guilty before God. We deserve hell, not heaven, but Christ died for us and rose again so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could receive eternal life and have this hope. If you don't have this hope, I encourage you to receive it. If you have doubts about the resurrection, I can recommend to you books, or if you're not a reader, uh, videos that uh, might encourage you to think more about the evidence for the resurrection. I encourage you, if you don't have this hope, to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Talk to me, talk to someone else who you know is a believer, that you might have this hope. If you do have this hope, then live like you have this hope. And I don't mean uh, always wear a fake smile and pretend that everything is fine when it's not. Because there are reasons to weep. In that moment, there wasn't a reason for Mary to weep. But there are reasons to weep in our lives. But in it all, we have hope through Jesus Christ that this is not the final thing. There is so much more that one day we will be welcomed because of our faith into the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will enter into the kind of life that we've always wanted, a life of perfect harmony, perfect joy, a life of great beauty and wonder. So if you don't have this hope, I encourage you to receive it. If you do have this hope, then even in the darkest times, remember that hope that you might get through uh, those dark days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for the hope that you've made available to each one of us through faith in your Son. I pray that each one would know this hope, receive this hope through faith in him. Lord, that we would live like people of hope, that we would not just always complain and always look at uh, the negative side of things, but Lord, that we would be hopeful people, positive people, knowing that you love us, that you sent Christ to die for us, and that you have great, a great plan in eternity for all of your children. We thank you and praise you. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.